Hello everyone. Welcome to the world of free education. Now we are going to read the first lesson of class 11th world history. Please use your headphone and don't forget to like and comment. So let's start. Chapter 1. Early societies. In this section we will read about two themes relating to early societies. First is about the beginnings of human existence from the remote past millions of years ago. We will learn how humans first emerged in Africa and how archaeologists have studied these early phases of history from remains of bones and stone tools. Archaeologists have made attempts to reconstruct the lives of early people to find out about the shelters in which they lived, the food they ate by gathering plant produce and hunting animals, and the ways in which they expressed themselves. The important developments include the use of fire and of language. And finally, we will see whether the lives of people who live by hunting and gathering today can help us to understand the past. Second theme deals with some of the earliest cities, those of Mesopotamia, present-day Iraq. These cities developed around temples and were centers of long-distance trade. Archaeological evidence, remains of old settlements, and an abundance of written material are used to reconstruct the lives of the different people who lived there: craftspeople, scribes, laborers, priests, kings, and queens. We will notice how pastoral people played an important role in some of these towns. Question to think about is whether the many activities that went on in cities would have been possible if writing had not developed. You may wonder as to how people who for millions of years have lived in forests, in caves, or temporary shelters began to eventually live in villages and cities. Well, the story is a long one and is related to several developments that took place at least 5,000 years before the establishment of the first cities. One of the most far-reaching changes was the gradual shift from nomadic life to settled agriculture, which began around 10,000 years ago. As you will see in theme one, prior to the adoption of agriculture, people had gathered plant produce as a source of food. Slowly, they learned more about different kinds of plants, where they grew, the seasons when they bore fruit, and so on. From this, they learned to grow plants. In West Asia, wheat and barley, peas, and various kinds of pulses were grown. In East and Southeast Asia, the crops that grew easily were millet and rice. Millet was also grown in Africa. Around the same time, people learned how to domesticate animals such as sheep, goat, cattle, pig, and donkey. Plant fibers such as cotton and flax, and animal fibers such as wool, were now woven into cloth. Somewhat later, about 5,000 years ago, domesticated animals such as cattle and donkeys were harnessed to plows and carts. These developments led to other changes as well. When people grew crops, they had to stay in the same place till the crops ripened. So, settled life became more common, and with that, people built more permanent structures in which to live. This was also the time when some communities learned how to make earthen pots. These were used to store grain and other produce, and to prepare and cook a variety of foods made from the new grains that were cultivated. In fact, a great deal of attention was given to processing foods to make them tasty and digestible. The way stone tools were made also changed. While earlier methods of making tools continued, some tools and equipment were now smoothened and polished by an elaborate process of grinding. New equipment included mortars and pestles for preparing grain, as well as stone axes and hoes, which were used to clear land for cultivation, as well as for digging the earth to sow seeds. In some areas, people learned to tap the ores of metals such as copper and tin. Sometimes, copper ores were collected and used for their distinctive bluish green color. This prepared the way for the more extensive use of metal for jewelry and for tools. Subsequently, there was also a growing familiarity with other kinds of produce from distant lands and seas. This included wood stones, including precious and semi-precious stones, metals and shell, and hardened volcanic lava. Early people were going from place to place, carrying goods and ideas with them. The increasing trade, the growth of villages and towns, and the movements of people in place of the small communities of early people there now grew small states. While these changes took place slowly over several thousand years, the pace quickened with the growth of the first cities. Also, the changes had far-reaching consequences. Some scholars have described this as a revolution, as the lives of people were probably transformed beyond recognition. Look out for continuities and changes as you explore these two contrasting themes in early history. Remember too that we have selected only some examples of early societies for detailed study. There were other kinds of early societies, including farming communities and pastoral peoples. There were other peoples who were hunter-gatherers as well as city dwellers, apart from the examples selected. Timeline I, six mile to one BCE. How to read timelines? 
we will find their timeline like this one in every section. Each of these will indicate some of the major processes and events in world history. As we study the timelines, remember, processes through which ordinary women and men have shaped history are far more difficult to date than events such as a war between kings. Some dates may indicate the beginning of a process or when it reaches maturation. Historians are constantly revising dates in the light of new evidence or new ways of assessing old data. While we have divided the timelines on a geographical basis as a matter of convenience, actual historical developments often transcend these divisions. Also, there is a chronological overlap in historical processes. Only some landmarks in human history have been shown here. We have highlighted the processes dealt with in the themes that follow, which also have separate timelines. Wherever you see a asterisk, you will also find an illustration related to the date along the column. Blank spaces do not mean that nothing was happening. Sometimes these indicate that we do not as yet know what was happening. We will be learning more about South Asian history in general and Indian history in particular next year. Dates selected for South Asia are only indicative of some of the developments in the subcontinent. This timeline focuses on the emergence of humans and the domestication of plants and animals. Highlights some major technological developments such as the use of fire, metals, plow agriculture and the wheel. The processes that are shown include the emergence of cities and the use of writing. We will also find mention of some of the earliest empire, a theme that will be developed in timeline 2. Theme 1. From the beginning of time. This chapter traces the beginning of human existence. It was 5.6 million years ago, written as Maya, that the first human-like creatures appeared on the Earth's surface. After this, several forms of humans emerged and then became extinct. Human beings resembling us, henceforth referred to as modern humans, originated about 160,000 years ago. During this long period of human history, people obtained food by either scavenging or hunting animals and gathering plant produce. They also learned how to make stone tools and to communicate with each other. Although other ways of obtaining food were adopted later, hunting gathering continued. Even today, there are hunter-gatherer societies in some parts of the world. This makes us wonder whether the lifestyles of present-day hunter-gatherers can tell us anything about the past. Fossils are the remains or impressions of a very old plant, animal or human which have turned into stone. These are often embedded in rock and are thus preserved for millions of years. Species is a group of organisms that can breed to produce fertile offspring. Members of one species cannot mate with those of other species to produce fertile offspring. Discoveries of human fossils, stone tools and cave paintings help us to understand early human history. Each of these discoveries has a history of its own. Very often, when such finds were first made, most scholars refused to accept that these fossils were the remains of early humans. They were also skeptical about the ability of early humans to make stone tools or paint. It was only over a period of time that the true significance of these finds was realized. The evidence for human evolution comes from fossils of species of humans which have become extinct. Fossils can be dated either through direct chemical analysis or indirectly by dating the sediments in which they are buried. Once fossils are dated, a sequence of human evolution can be worked out. When such discoveries were first made about 200 years ago, many scholars were often reluctant to accept that fossils and other finds including stone tools and paintings were actually connected with early forms of humans. This reluctance generally stemmed from their belief in the Old Testament of the Bible according to which human origin was regarded as an act of creation by God. For instance, in August 1856, workmen who were quarrying for limestone in the Neander Valley, see map 2, p. Dean A. Gorge near the German city of Dusseldorf found a skull and some skeletal fragments. These were handed over to Karl Fuhrott, a local schoolmaster and natural historian, who realized that they did not belong to a modern human. He then made a plaster cast of the skull and sent it to Hermann Schaffhausen, a professor of anatomy at Bonn University. The following year, they jointly published a paper claiming that the skull represented a form of human that was extinct. At that time, scholars did not accept this view and instead declared that the skull belonged to a person of more recent times. Recovering fossils. A painstaking process. The precise location of finds is important for dating. Shows the equipment used to record the location of finds. The square frame to the left of the archaeologist is a grid divided into 10 cm squares. Placing it over the find spot helps to record the horizontal position of the find. Triangular apparatus to the right is used to record the vertical position. 
shows how a fossil fragment is recovered from the surrounding stone, in this case a variety of limestone in which it is embedded. As you can see, this requires skill and patience. 24th of November 1859, when Charles Darwin's On the Origin of Species was published, marked a landmark in the study of evolution. Over 1,250 copies of the first print were sold out the same day. Darwin argued that humans had evolved from animals a long time ago. Activity 1. Most religions have stories about the creation of human beings which often do not correspond with scientific discoveries. Find out about some of these and compare them with the history of human evolution as discussed in this chapter. The Skull of Neanderthal Man Some of those who dismissed the antiquity of the skull regarded it as brutish or that of a pathological idiot. The story of Human Evolution Take the precursors of modern human beings look at these four skulls. He belongs to an ape. He belongs to a species known as Australopithecus, see below. C belongs to a species known as Homo erectus, literally upright man. He belongs to a species known as Homo sapiens, literally thinking, wise man, to which all present-day human beings belong. This has many similarities and differences that you notice, looking carefully at the brain case, jaws and teeth. Differences that you notice in the skulls shown in the illustration are some of the changes that came about as a result of human evolution. The story of human evolution is enormously long and somewhat complicated. There are also many unanswered questions and new data often lead to a revision and modification of earlier understandings. Let us look at some of the developments and their implications more closely. It's possible to trace these developments back to between 36 and 24 Maya. We sometimes find it difficult to conceptualize such long spans of time. If you consider a page of your book to represent 10,000 years, in itself a vast span of time, 10 pages would represent 100,000 years, and a 100 pages would equal 1 million year. Think of 36 million years, you would have to imagine a book 3,600 pages long. It was when primates, a category of mammals, emerged in Asia and Africa. Subsequently, by about 24 Maya, there emerged a subgroup amongst primates called hominoids. This included apes. And much later, about 5.6 Maya, we find evidence of the first hominids. Primates are a subgroup of a larger group of mammals. They include monkeys, apes, and humans. They have body hair, a relatively long gestation period following birth, mammary glands, different types of teeth, and the ability to maintain a constant body temperature. While hominids have evolved from hominoids and share certain common features, there are major differences as well. Hominoids have a smaller brain than hominids. They are quadrupeds walking on all fours but with flexible forelines. Hominids, by contrast, have an upright posture and bipedal locomotion, walking on two feet. There are also marked differences in the hand which enables the making and use of tools. We will examine the kinds of tools made and their significance more closely later. Two lines of evidence suggest an African origin for hominids. First, it is the group of African apes that are most closely related to hominids. Second, the earliest hominid fossils, which belong to the genus Australopithecus, have been found in East Africa and date back to about 5.6 Maya. In contrast, fossils found outside Africa are no older than 1.8 million years. The evolution of the hand. A. A shows the precision grip of the chimpanzee. B shows the power grip of the human hand. C shows the precision grip of the hominid. Development of the power grip probably preceded the precision grip. Compare the precision grip of the chimpanzee with that of the human hand. Make a list of the things you do using a precision grip. What are the things you do using a power grip? Hominids belong to a family known as hominidae, which includes all forms of human beings. Distinctive characteristics of hominids include a large brain size, upright posture, bipedal locomotion and specialization of the hand. Hominids are further subdivided into branches, known as genus, of which Australopithecus and Homo are important. Each of these in turn includes several species. The major differences between Australopithecus and Homo relate to brain size, jaws and teeth. The former has a smaller brain size, heavier jaws and larger teeth than the latter. Virtually all the names given by scientists to species are derived from Latin and Greek words. For instance, the name Australopithecus comes from a Latin word, austral, meaning southern, and a Greek word, pitekos, meaning ape. 
Green was given because this earliest form of human still retained many features of an ape, such as a relatively small brain size in comparison to Homo, large back teeth and limited dexterity of the hands. Right walking was also restricted as they still spent a lot of time on trees. Retained characteristics such as long forelimbs, curved hand and foot bones and mobile ankle joints suited to life on trees. Hominoids are different from monkeys in a number of ways. They have a larger body and do not have a tail. Besides, there is a longer period of infant development and dependency amongst hominoids. This is a view of the Oldubi Gorge in the Rift Valley, East Africa, see Map 1B, P.14, 1 of. The areas from which traces of early human history have been recovered. Notice the different levels of Earth at the center of the photograph. Each of these represents a distinct geological phase. Over time, as tool making and long distance walking increased, many human characteristics also developed. Discovery of Australopithecus Oldubi Gorge, July 1959. The Oldubi Gorge, CP. 14 was first discovered in the early 20th century by a German butterfly collector. However, Oldubi has come to be identified with Mary and Louis Leakey, who worked here for over 40 years. It was Mary Leakey who directed archaeological excavations at Oldubi and later Lee and she made some of the most exciting discoveries. This is what Louis Leakey wrote about one of their most remarkable finds. That morning I woke with a headache and a slight fever. Reluctantly, I agreed to spend the day in camp. With one of us out of commission, it was even more vital for the other to continue the work, for our precarious seven-week season was running out. So Mary departed for the diggings with Sally and Toots, two of their dogs, in the Land Rover, a jeep-like vehicle, and I settled back to a restless day off. Some time later, perhaps I dozed off, I heard the Land Rover coming up fast to camp. I had a momentary vision of Mary stunned by one of our hundreds of resident scorpions or bitten by a snake that had slipped past the dogs. The Land Rover rattled to a stop, and I heard Mary's voice calling over and over, I've got him. I've got him. I've got him. Still groggy from the headache, I couldn't make her out. Got what? Are you hurt? I asked. Him, the man. Our man, Mary said. The one we've been looking for 23 years. Come quick, I've found his teeth. From Finding the World's Earliest Man by LSB. Wiki, National Geographic, 118, September 1960. The remains of early humans have been classified into different species. These are often distinguished from one another on the basis of differences in bone structure. For instance, species of early humans are differentiated in terms of their skull size and distinctive jaws, see illustration on P.10. These characteristics may have evolved due to what has been called the positive feedback mechanism. Positive feedback mechanism. The arrows pointing towards a box indicate the influences that shaped that particular development. The arrows pointing away from a box indicate how developments mentioned in the box influenced other processes. For example, bipedalism enabled hands to be freed for carrying infants or objects. In turn, as hands were used more and more, upright walking gradually became more efficient. Apart from the advantage of freeing hands for various uses, far less energy is consumed while walking as compared to the movement of a quadruped. However, the advantage in terms of saving energy is reversed while running. There is indirect evidence of bipedalism as early as 3.6 mile. This comes from the fossilized hominid footprints at Leto Leap, Tanzania, C-section cover. Fossil limb bones recovered from harder Ethiopia provide more direct evidence of bipedalism. Around 2.5 mile, with the onset of a phase of glaciation or an ice age when large parts of the earth were covered with snow, there were major changes in climate and vegetation. Due to the reduction in temperatures as well as rainfall, grassland areas expanded at the expense of forests, leading to the gradual extinction of the early forms of Australopithecus that were adapted to forests and the replacement by species that were better adapted to the drier conditions. Among these were the earliest representatives of the genus Homo. Homo is a Latin word meaning man, although there were women as well. Scientists distinguish amongst several types of Homo. The names assigned to these species are derived from what are regarded as their typical characteristics. So fossils are classified as Homo habilis, the tool maker, Homo erectus, the upright man, and Homo sapiens, the wiser thinking man. Fossils of Homo habilis have been discovered at Homo in Ethiopia and at Oldubi Gorge in Tanzania. The earliest fossils of Homo erectus have been found both in Africa and Asia, Kudu Fora and West Turkana, Kenya, Mochokoto and Sindhurin, Java. 
As the finds in Asia belong to a later date than those in Africa, it is likely that hominids migrated from East Africa to Southern and Northern Africa, to Southern and Northeastern Asia, and perhaps to Europe, sometime between 2 and 1.5 Maya. Species survived for nearly a million years. Up 1. A. Africa. Up 1. B. The East African Rift Valley, the Rift Valley, East Africa. In some instances, the names for fossils are derived from the places where the first fossils of a particular type were found. Though fossils found in Heidelberg, a city in Germany, were called Homo heidelbergensis, while those found in the Neander Valley, CP. The team were categorized as Homo neanderthalensis. The earliest fossils from Europe are of Homo heidelbergensis and Homo neanderthalensis. Both belong to the species of archaic, that is old, Homo sapiens. Fossils of Homo heidelbergensis 0.8 minus 0.1 Maya have a wide distribution, having been found in Africa, Asia, and Europe. The Neanderthals occupied Europe and Western and Central Asia from roughly 130,000 to 35,000 years ago. They disappeared abruptly in Western Europe around 35,000 years ago. In general, compared with Australopithecus, Homo have a larger brain, jaws with a reduced outward protrusion and smaller teeth. See illustration on P. M. An increase in brain size is associated with more intelligence and a better memory. Changes in the jaws and teeth were probably related to differences in dietary habits. Activity 2. Plot the changes indicated in the chart above on an outline map of the world. Use different colors for the four time brackets. List the continents where you use A. A single color, B. Two colors, C. More than two colors. Story of human evolution, B. Modern human beings. If you look at this chart, you will notice that some of the earliest evidence for Homo sapiens has been found in different parts of Africa. This raises the question of the center of human origin. Was there a single center or were there several? The issue of the place of origin of modern humans has been much debated. Two totally divergent views have been expounded, one advocating the regional continuity model, with multiple regions of origin, the other the replacement model, with a single origin in Africa. According to the regional continuity model, the archaic Homo sapiens in different regions gradually evolved at different rates into modern humans and hence the variation in the first appearance of modern humans in different parts of the world. The argument is based on the regional differences in the features of present-day humans. According to those who advocate this view, these dissimilarities are due to differences between the pre-existing Homo erectus and Homo heidelbergensis populations that occupied the same regions. Replacement and regional continuity models The replacement model visualizes the complete replacement everywhere of all older forms of humans with modern humans. In support of this view is the evidence of the genetic and anatomical homogeneity of modern humans. Those who suggest this argue that the enormous similarity amongst modern humans is due to their descent from a population that originated in a single region, which is Africa. The evidence of the earliest fossils of modern humans from Homo in Ethiopia also supports the replacement model. Scholars who hold this view suggest that the physical differences observed today among modern humans are the result of adaptation over a span of thousands of years by populations who migrated to the particular regions where they finally settled down. Three humans' ways of obtaining food. So far, we have been considering the evidence of skeletal remains and seeing how these have been used to reconstruct the histories of the movements of peoples across continents. There are other, more routine aspects of human life as well. Let us see how these can be studied. Early humans would have obtained food through a number of ways, such as gathering, hunting, scavenging, and fishing. Gathering would involve collecting plant foods such as seeds, nuts, berries, fruits, and tubers. Gathering was practiced as generally assumed rather than conclusively established, as there is very little direct evidence for it. While we get a fair amount of fossil bones, fossilized plant remains are relatively rare. The only other way of getting information about plant intake would be if plant remains were accidentally burnt. This process results in carbonization. In this form, organic matter is preserved for a long span of time. However, so far archaeologists have not found much evidence of carbonized seeds for this very early period. In recent years, the term hunting has been under discussion by scholars. Increasingly, it has been suggested that the early hominids scavenged or foraged asteric for meat and marrow from the carcasses of animals that had died naturally or had been killed by other predators. It is equally possible that small mammals such as rodents, birds, and their eggs, reptiles and even insects such as termites were eaten by early hominids. Asteric foraging means to search for food. 
Hunting probably began later, about 500,000 years ago. The earliest clear evidence for the deliberate plant hunting and butchery of large mammals comes from two sites, Boxgrove in southern England, 500,000 years ago, and Skoningen in Germany, 400,000 years ago, see Map 2. Fishing was also important, as is evident from the discovery of fish bones at different sites. Map 2, Europe. From about 35,000 years ago, there is evidence of plant hunting from some European sites. Some sites, such as Dolny Westernice in the Czech Republic, see Map 2, which was near a river, seem to have been deliberately chosen by early people. Herds of migratory animals such as reindeer and horse probably crossed the river during their autumn and spring migrations and were killed on a large scale. The choice of such sites indicates that people knew about the movement of these animals and also about the means of killing large numbers of animals quickly. Men and women have different roles in gathering, scavenging, hunting and fishing do not really know. Today we find societies that live by hunting and gathering, where women and men undertake a range of different activities, but, as we will see later in the chapter, it is not always possible to suggest parallels with the past. Early humans. From trees, to caves and open-air sites. We are on surer ground when we try to reconstruct the evidence for patterns of residence. One way of doing this is by plotting the distribution of artifacts. For example, thousands of flake tools and hand axes have been excavated at Kilim and Alot Sele, Kenya. These finds are dated between 700,000 and 500,000 years ago. Left the site of Alot Sele. The excavators, Mary and Lewis Leakey, had a catwalk built around the site for observers. Above, a close-up of tools found at the site, including hand axes. How did these tools accumulate in one place? It is possible that some places where food resources were abundant were visited repeatedly. In such areas, people would tend to leave behind traces of their activities and presence, including artifacts. Deposited artifacts would appear as patches on the landscape. The places that were less frequently visited would have fewer artifacts, which may have been scattered over the surface. It is also important to remember that the same locations could have been shared by hominids, other primates and carnivores. Look at the diagram below to see how this may have worked. Archaeologists suggest that early hominids such as Homo habilis probably consumed most. The food where they found it slept in different places and spent much of their time in trees. How would bones have reached the site? How would stones have reached the site? Would bones have survived intact? Artifacts are objects that are made by human beings. The term can refer to a wide range of things, tools, paintings, sculpture, engravings. Between 400,000 and 125,000 years ago, caves and open-air sites began to be used. Evidence for this comes from sites in Europe. In the Lazarite Cave in southern France, a 12x4 meters shelter was built against the cave wall. Inside it were two hearts and evidence of different food sources, fruits, vegetables, seeds, nuts, bird eggs and freshwater fish, trout, perch and carp. At another site, Terra Amateur on the coast of southern France, flimsy shelters with roofs of wood and grasses were built for shorter, seasonal visits. Pieces of baked clay and burnt bone along with stone tools, dated between 1.4 and 1 mile, have been found at Chisaunja, Kenya and Swatkrans, South Africa. These the result of a natural bushfire or volcanic eruption, or were they produced through the deliberate, controlled use of fire? We do not really know. This is a reconstruction of a hut at Terra Amata. The large stone boulders were used to support the sides of the hut. Small scatters of stone on the floor were places where people made stone tools. A black spot marked with an arrow indicates a hearth. In what ways do you think life for those who lived in this shelter would be different from that of the hominids who lived? In trees. Hearths, on the other hand, are indications of the controlled use of fire. This had several advantages, fire provided warmth and light inside caves and could be used for cooking. Besides, fire was used to harden wood, as for instance the tip of the spear. The use of heat also facilitated the flaking of tools. As important, fire could be used to scare away dangerous animals. Only humans making tools. To start with, it is useful to remember that the use of tools and tool making are not confined to humans. Birds are known to make objects to assist them with feeding, hygiene and social encounters, and while foraging for food some chimpanzees use tools that they have made. However, there are some features of human tool making that are not known among apes. As we have seen, CP, 
11. Certain anatomical and neurological related to the nervous system adaptations have helped to the skilled use of hands probably due to the important role of tools in human lives. Moreover, the ways in which humans use and make tools often require greater memory and complex organizational skills, both of which are absent in apes. The earliest evidence for the making and use of stone tools comes from sites in Ethiopia and Kenya, see Map 1. It is likely that the earliest stone tool makers were the Australopithecus. Some early tools. These tools were found in Old Dubi. The one above is a chopper. This is a large stone from which flakes have been removed to produce a working edge. The one below is a hand axe. Can we suggest what these tools may have been used for? As in the case of other activities, we do not know whether tool making was done by men or women or both. It's possible that stone tool makers were both women and men. Men in particular may have made and used tools to obtain food for themselves as well as to sustain their children after weaning. About 35,000 years ago, improvements in the techniques for killing animals are evident from the appearance of new kinds of tools such as spur throws and the bore and arrow. The meat thus obtained was probably processed by removing the bones, followed by drying, smoking and storage. As food could be stored for later consumption. A spear thrower, note the carving on the handle. The use of the spear thrower enabled hunters to hurl spears over longer distances. Can we suggest any advantage in using such equipment? There were other changes, such as the trapping of fur-bearing animals to use the fur for clothing and the invention of swing needles. The earliest evidence of sewn clothing comes from about 21,000 years ago. Besides, with the introduction of the punch wheel technique to make small chisel-like tools, it was now possible to make engravings on bone, antler, ivory or wood. Punch wheel technique. Eight, the top of a large pebble is removed using a hammer stone. Eight, this produces a flat surface called the striking platform. See, this is then struck using a hammer and a punch made of bone or antler. Eight, this leads to the production of blades that can be used as knives or modified to serve as chisels. Burrows which could be used to engrave bone, antler, ivory or wood. Eight, an example of engraving on bone. Note the drawings of animals on it. Rules of communication, language and art. Among living beings, it is humans alone that have a language. There are several views on language development. One, that hominid language involved gestures or hand movements. Two, that spoken language was preceded by vocal but non-verbal communication such as singing or humming. Three, that human speech probably began with calls like the ones that have been observed among primates. Humans may have possessed a small number of speech sounds in the initial stage. Gradually, these may have developed into language. And did spoken language emerge? It has been suggested that the brain of Homo habilis had certain features which would have made it possible for them to speak. This language may have developed as early as to Maya. The evolution of the vocal tract was equally important. This occurred around 200,000 years ago. It is more specifically associated with modern humans. A third suggestion is that language developed around the same time as art, that is, around 40,000 minus 35,000 years ago. Development of spoken language has been seen as closely connected with art, since both are media for communication. If paintings at Altamira. Altamira is a cave site in Spain. The paintings on the ceiling of the cave were first brought to the attention of Marcelino Sanz de Sotiola, a local landowner and an amateur archaeologist, by his daughter Maria in November 1879. The little girl was running about in the cavern and playing about here and there, while her father was digging the floor of the cave. Suddenly she noticed the paintings on the ceiling, with papa, oxen. At first, her father just laughed but soon realized that some sort of paste rather than paint had been used for the paintings and became so enthusiastic that he could hardly speak. He published a booklet the following year, but for almost two decades his findings were dismissed by European archaeologists on the ground that these were too good to be ancient. Drawing of a bison at Altamira, northern Spain. Hundreds of paintings of animals, done between 30,000 and 12,000 years ago, have been discovered in the caves of Lasso and Chauvet, both in France and Altamira, in Spain. These include depictions of bison, horses, ibex, deer, mammoths, rhinos, lions, bears, panthers, hyenas and owls. No questions have been raised and answered regarding these paintings. For example, why do some areas of caves have paintings and not others? Why were some animals painted and not others? Why were men painted both individually and in groups, whereas women were depicted only in groups? Why were men painted near animals but never women? Why were groups of animals painted in the sections of caves where sounds carried well? 
Several explanations have been offered. One is that because of the importance of hunting, the paintings of animals were associated with ritual and magic. The act of painting could have been a ritual to ensure a successful hunt. Another explanation offered is that these caves were possibly meeting places for small groups of people or locations for group activities. These groups could share hunting techniques and knowledge while paintings and engravings served as the media for passing information from one generation to the next. The above account of early societies has been based on archaeological evidence. Clearly, there is much that we still do not know. As mentioned at the beginning of this chapter, hunter-gatherer societies exist even today. Can one learn anything about past societies from present-day hunter-gatherers? This is a question we will address in the next section. Early Encounters with Hunter-Gatherers in Africa The following is an account by a member of an African pastoral group about its initial contact in 1870 with the Nisan, a hunter-gatherer society living in the Kalahari Desert. When we first came into this area, all we saw were strange footprints in the sand. We wondered what kind of people these were. They were very afraid of us and would hide whenever we came around. We found their villages, but they were always empty because as soon as they saw strangers coming, they would scatter and hide in the bush. He said, oh, this is good, these people are afraid of us, they are weak and we can easily rule over them. So we just ruled them. There was no killing or fighting. We will read more about encounters with hunter-gatherers in themes 8 and 10. The Hadza The Hadza are a small group of hunters and gatherers living in the vicinity of Lake Iasi, a salt rift valley lake. The country of the eastern Hadza, dry, rocky savanna, dominated by thorn scrub and acacia trees, is rich in wild foods. Animals are exceptionally numerous and were certainly common at the beginning of the century. Elephant, rhinoceros, buffalo, giraffe, zebra, waterbuck, gazelle, warthog, baboon, lion, leopard, and hyena are all common, as are smaller animals such as porcupine, hare, jackal, tortoise, and many others. All of these animals, apart from the elephant, are hunted and eaten by the Hadza. The amount of meat that could be regularly eaten without endangering the future of the game is probably greater than anywhere else in the world where hunters and gatherers live or have lived in the recent past. Vegetable food, roots, berries, the fruit of the baobab tree, etc. Not often obvious to the casual observer is always abundant even at the height of the dry season in a year of drought. Type of vegetable food available is different in the six-month wet season from the dry season but there is no period of shortage. The honey and grubs of seven species of wild bee are eaten, supplies of these vary from season to season and from year to year. Sources of water are widely distributed over the country in the wet season but are very few in the dry season. The Hadza consider that about 5-6 km is the maximum distance over which water can reasonably be carried and camps are normally sited within a kilometer of a water course. Part of the country consists of open grass plains but the Hadza never build camps there. Camps are invariably sited among trees or rocks and, by preference, among both. The Eastern Hadza assert no rights over land and its resources. Any individual may live wherever he likes and may hunt animals, collect roots, berries, and honey and draw water anywhere in Hadza country without any sort of restriction. In spite of the exceptional numbers of game animals in their area, the Hadza rely mainly on wild vegetable matter for their food. Probably as much as 80% of their food by weight is vegetable, while meat and honey together account for the remaining 20%. Amps are commonly small and widely dispersed in the wet season, large and concentrated near the few available sources of water in the dry season. There is never any shortage of food even in the time of drought, written in 1960 by James Woodburn, an anthropologist. Anthropology is a discipline that studies human culture and evolutionary aspects of human biology. Activity 3. Why do the Hadza not assert rights over land and its resources? Why do the size and location of camps keep changing from season to season? Why is there never any shortage of food even in times of drought? Can you name any such hunter-gatherer societies in India today? Hunter-gatherer societies from the present to the past. As our knowledge of present-day hunter-gatherers increased through studies by anthropologists, a question that began to be posed was whether the information about living hunters and gatherers could be used to understand past societies. Currently, there are two opposing views on this issue. On one side are scholars who have directly applied specific data from present-day hunter-gatherer societies to interpret the archaeological remains of the past. 
For example, some archaeologists have suggested that the hominid sites dated to Tumaya along the margins of Lake Turkana could have been dry season camps of early humans because such a practice has been observed among the Hadza and Thay. Hussan. On the other side are scholars who feel that ethnographic data cannot be used for understanding past societies as the two are totally different. For instance, present-day hunter-gatherer societies pursue several other economic activities along with hunting and gathering. These include engaging in exchange and trade in minor forest produce or working as paid laborers in the fields of neighboring farmers. Moreover, these societies are totally marginalized in all senses, geographically, politically and socially. The conditions in which they live are very different from those of early humans. Another problem is that there is tremendous variation amongst living hunter-gatherer societies. There are conflicting data on many issues such as the relative importance of hunting and gathering, group sizes, or the movement from place to place. Also, there is little consensus regarding the division of labor in food procurement. Although today generally women gather and men hunt, there are societies where both women and men hunt and gather and make tools. In any case, the important role of women in contributing to the food supply in such societies cannot be denied. It's perhaps this factor that ensures a relatively equal role for both women and men in present-day hunter-gatherer societies, although there are variations. While this may be the case today, it is difficult to make any such inference for the past. Ethnography is the study of contemporary ethnic groups. It includes an examination of their modes of livelihood, technology, gender roles, rituals, political institutions, and social customs. Dog. For several million years, humans lived by hunting wild animals and gathering wild plants. Then, between 10,000 and 4,500 years ago, people in different parts of the world learned to domesticate certain plants and animals. Cell to the development of farming and pastoralism as a way of life. The shift from foraging to farming was a major turning point in human history. Why did this change take place at this point of time? The last ice age came to an end about 13,000 years ago and with that warmer, wetter conditions prevailed. As a result, conditions were favorable for the growth of grasses such as wild barley and wheat. At the same time, as open forests and grasslands expanded, the population of certain animal species such as wild sheep, goat, cattle, pig and donkey increased. What we find is that human societies began to gradually prefer areas that had an abundance of wild grasses and animals. Now relatively large permanent communities occupied such areas for most parts of the year. Some areas being clearly preferred, a pressure may have built up to increase the food supply. This may have triggered the process of domestication of certain plants and animals. It is likely that a combination of factors which included climatic change, population pressure, a greater reliance on and knowledge of a few species of plants, such as wheat, barley, rice and millet, and animals, such as sheep, goat, cattle, donkey and pig, played a role in this transformation. In such area where farming and pastoralism began around 10,000 years ago was the Fertile Crescent, extending from the Mediterranean coast to the Zagros Mountains in Iran. The introduction of agriculture, more people began to stay in one place for even longer periods than they had done before. As permanent houses began to be built of mud, mud bricks and even stone. These are some of the earliest villages known to archaeologists. Activity 4. What do you think are the advantages and disadvantages of using ethnographic accounts to reconstruct the lives of the earliest peoples? Farming and pastoralism led to the introduction of many other changes such as the making of pots in which to store grain and other produce and to cook food. Besides, new kinds of stone tools came into use. Other new tools such as the plow were used in agriculture. Gradually, people became familiar with metals such as copper and tin. Beam, important for both pot making and transportation, came into use. About 5,000 years ago, even larger concentrations of people began to live together in cities. Why did this happen? And what are the differences between cities and other settlements? Look out for answers to these and other questions in theme 2. Rift Valley, East Africa. The sizes answer in brief. 1. Look at the diagram showing the positive feedback mechanism on page 13. And you list the inputs that went into tool making. What were the processes that were strengthened by tool making? 2. Humans and mammals such as monkeys and apes have certain similarities in behavior and anatomy indicates that humans possibly evolved from apes. List these resemblances in two columns under the headings of A, behavior, and B, anatomy. Are there any differences that you think are noteworthy? 
A. Discuss the arguments advance in favor of the regional continuity model of human origins. You think it provides a convincing explanation of the archaeological evidence. Reasons for your answer. 4. Which of the following do you think is best documented in the archaeological record? A. Gathering. B. Tool making. C. The use of fire. Answer in a short essay. 5. Discuss the extent to which A. Hunting and B. Constructing shelters would have been facilitated by the use of language. What other modes of communication could have been used for these activities? 6. Choose any two developments each from timelines 1 and 2 at the end of the chapter and indicate why you think these are significant. 2. Writing and city life. City life began in Mesopotamia asterisk the land between the Euphrates and the Tigris rivers that is now part of the Republic of Iraq. Mesopotamian civilization is known for its prosperity, city life, its voluminous and rich literature and its mathematics and astronomy. Mesopotamia's writing system and literature spread to the eastern Mediterranean, northern Syria, and Turkey after 2000 BCE, so that the kingdoms of that entire region were writing to one another, and to the pharaoh of Egypt in the language and script of Mesopotamia. Here we shall explore the connection between city life and writing, and then look at some outcomes of a sustained tradition of writing. Asterisk the name Mesopotamia is derived from the Greek words mesos, meaning middle, and potamos, meaning river. In the beginning of recorded history, the land, mainly the urbanized South Sea discussion below, was called Sumer and Akkad. After 2000 BCE, when Babylon became an important city, the term Babylonia was used for the southern region. From about 1100 BCE, when the Assyrians established their kingdom in the north, the region became known as Assyria. The first known language of the land was Sumerian. It was gradually replaced by Akkadian around 2400 BCE when Akkadian speakers arrived. Its language flourished till about Alexander's time, 336-323 BCE, with some regional changes occurring. From 1400 BCE, Aramaic also trickled in. This language, similar to Hebrew, became widely spoken after 1000 BCE. Still spoken in parts of Iraq. Archaeology in Mesopotamia began in the 1840s. At one or two sites, including Arak and Mari, which we discuss below, excavations continued for decades. No Indian site has ever seen such long-term projects. Not only can we study hundreds of Mesopotamian buildings, statues, ornaments, graves, tools and seals as sources, there are thousands of written documents. Mesopotamia was important to Europeans because of references to it in the Old Testament, the first part of the Bible. For instance, the Book of Genesis of the Old Testament refers to Shemer, meaning Sumer, as a land of brick-built cities. Travelers and scholars of Europe looked on Mesopotamia as a kind of ancestral land, and when archaeological work began in the area, there was an attempt to prove the literal truth of the Old Testament. From the mid-19th century, there was no stopping the enthusiasm for exploring the ancient past of Mesopotamia. In 1873, a British newspaper funded an expedition of the British Museum to search for a tablet narrating the story of the flood mentioned in the Bible. In the 1960s, it was understood that the stories of the Old Testament were not literally true, but may have been ways of expressing memories about important changes in history. Gradually, archaeological techniques became far more sophisticated and refined. What is more, attention was directed to different questions, including reconstructing the lives of ordinary people. Establishing the literal truth of biblical narratives receded into the background. Much of what we discuss subsequently in the chapter is based on these later studies. According to the Bible, the flood was meant to destroy all life on earth. However, God chose a man, Noah, to ensure that life could continue after the flood. Noah built a huge boat, an ark. He took a pair each of all known species of animals and birds on board the ark, which survived the flood. There was a strikingly similar story in the Mesopotamian tradition, where the principal character was called Zeusudra or Utnapishtim. Act 1, West Asia. Activity 1. Many societies have myths about floods. These are often ways of preserving and expressing memories about important changes in history. Find out more about these, noting how life before and after the flood is represented. Mesopotamia and its geography. Iraq is a land of diverse environments. In the northeast lie green, undulating plains, gradually rising to tree-covered mountain ranges with clear streams and wild flowers, with enough rainfall to grow crops. Agriculture began between 7000 and 6000 BCE. 
In the north, there is a stretch of upland called a steppe, where animal herding offers people a better livelihood than agriculture. After the winter rains, sheep and goats feed on the grasses and low shrubs that grow here. The east tributaries of the Tigris provide routes of communication into the mountains of Iran. South is a desert, and this is where the first cities and writing emerged. See below. This desert could support cities because the rivers Euphrates and Tigris, which rise in the northern mountains, carry loads of silt, fine mud. When they flood or when their water is let out onto the fields, fertile silt is deposited. Up to Mesopotamia, mountains, steppe, desert, irrigated zone of the south. After the Euphrates has entered the desert, its water flows out into small channels. These channels flood their banks and, in the past, functioned as irrigation canals, water could be let into the fields of wheat, barley, peas or lentils when necessary. For the ancient systems, that of the Roman Empire, theme 3 included, it was the agriculture of southern Mesopotamia that was the most productive even though the region did not have sufficient rainfall to grow crops. Not only agriculture, Mesopotamian sheep and goats that grazed on the steppe, the northeastern plains and the mountain slopes, that is, on tracts too high for the rivers to flood and fertilize, produced meat, milk and wool in abundance. Further, fish was available in rivers and date palms gave fruit in summer. Let us not, however, make the mistake of thinking that cities grew simply because of rural prosperity. We shall discuss other factors by and by, but first let us be clear about city life. Significance of urbanism Cities and towns are not just places with large populations. It is when an economy develops in spheres other than food production that it becomes an advantage for people to cluster in towns. Urban economies comprise besides food production, trade, manufactures and services. City people, thus, cease to be self-sufficient and depend on the products or services of other, city or village people. There is continuous interaction among them. For instance, the carver of a stone seal requires bronze tools that he himself cannot make, and colored stones for the seals that he does not know where to get. His specialization is fine carving, not trading. A bronze tool maker does not himself go out to get the metals, copper and tin. Besides, he needs regular supplies of charcoal for fuel. The division of labor is a mark of urban life. Further, there must be a social organization in place. Fuel, metal, various stones, wood ETC, come from many different places for city manufacturers. This organized trade and storage is needed. There are deliveries of grain and other food items from the village to the city, and food supplies need to be stored and distributed. Besides, many different activities have to be coordinated. There must be not only stones but also bronze tools and pots available for seal cutters. Obviously, in such a system some people give commands that others obey, and urban economies often require the keeping of written records. The earliest cities in Mesopotamia date back to the Bronze Age, C.3000 BCE. Bronze is an alloy of copper and tin. Using bronze meant procuring these metals often from great distances. Metal tools were necessary for accurate carpentry, drilling beads, carving stone seals, cutting shell for inlaid furniture, etc. Mesopotamian weapons were also of bronze, for example, the tips of the spears that you see in the illustration on P. 38. The Varka Head This woman's head was sculpted in white marble at Arak before 3000 BCE. The eyes and eyebrows would probably have taken lapis lazuli blue and shell, white and bitumen, black inlays, respectively. There is a groove along the top of the head, perhaps for an ornament. This is a world-famous piece of sculpture admired for the delicate modeling of the woman's mouth, chin and cheeks. And it was modeled in a hard stone that would have been imported from a distance. Beginning with the procurement of stone, list all the specialists who would be involved in the production of such a piece of sculpture. Activity 2. Discuss whether city life would have been possible without the use of metals. Movement of goods into cities. However rich the food resources of Mesopotamia, its mineral resources were few. Most parts of the south lacked stones for tools, seals and jewels, the wood of the Iraqi date palm and poplar was not good enough for carts, cart wheels or boats, and there was no metal for tools, vessels or ornaments. So we can surmise that the ancient Mesopotamians could have traded their abundant textiles and agricultural produce for wood, copper, tin, silver, gold, shell and various stones from Turkey and Iran or across the Gulf. These latter regions had mineral resources, but much less scope for agriculture. Regular exchanges, possible only when there was a social organization, to equip foreign expeditions and direct the exchanges were initiated by the people of southern Mesopotamia. Besides crafts, trade and services, efficient transport is also important for urban development. 
If it takes too much time or too much animal feed to carry grain or charcoal into cities on pack animals or bullock carts, the city economy will not be viable. Cheapest mode of transportation is everywhere over water. River boats or barges loaded with sacks of grain are propelled by the current of the river and a wind, but when animals transport goods, they need to be fed. Canals and natural channels of ancient Mesopotamia were in fact routes of goods transport between large and small settlements, and in the account of the city of Mari later in the chapter, the importance of the Euphrates as a world route will become clear. Development of writing All societies have languages in which certain spoken sounds convey certain meanings. This is verbal communication. Writing too is verbal communication, but in a different way. When we talk about writing or a script, we mean that spoken sounds are represented in visible signs. A tablet C.3200 BCE. Each tablet is 3.5 cm or less in height with picture-like signs, ox, fish, grain, boat, and numbers. First Mesopotamian tablets, written around 3200 BCE, contained picture-like signs and numbers. These were about 5,000 lists of oxen, fish, bread loaves, etc. Lists of goods that were brought into or distributed from the temples of Arak, a city in the south. Early, writing began when society needed to keep records of transactions, because in city life transactions occurred at different times and involved many people and a variety of goods. Near form syllabic signs. Mesopotamians wrote on tablets of clay. A scribe would wet clay and pat it into a size he could hold comfortably in one hand. He would carefully smoothen its surfaces. With the sharp end of a reed cut obliquely, he would press wedge-shaped cuneiform asterisk signs onto the smoothened surface while it was still moist. A clay tablet written on both sides in cuneiform. It is a mathematical exercise. You can see a triangle and lines across the triangle on the top of the obverse side. You can see that the letters have been pressed into the clay. Once dried in the sun, the clay would harden and tablets would be almost as indestructible as pottery. In a written record of Tse, the delivery of pieces of metal had ceased to be relevant, the tablet was thrown away. Once the surface dried, signs could not be pressed onto a tablet, so each transaction, however minor, required a separate written tablet. This is why tablets occur by the hundreds at Mesopotamian sites. And it is because of this wealth of sources that we know so much more about Mesopotamia than we do about contemporary India. Asterisk cuneiform is derived from the Latin words cunis, meaning wedge, and forma, meaning shape. By 2600 BCE or so, the letters became cuneiform and the language was Sumerian. Writing was now used not only for keeping records, but also for making dictionaries, giving legal validity to land transfers, narrating the deeds of kings, and announcing the changes a king had made in the customary laws of the land. Sumerian, the earliest known language of Mesopotamia, was gradually replaced after 2400 BCE by the Akkadian language. Cuneiform writing in the Akkadian language continued in use until the 1st century CE, that is, for more than 2000 years. System of writing The sound that a cuneiform sign represented was not a single consonant or vowel, such as M or A in the English alphabet, but syllables, say, put, or lull, or in. The signs that a Mesopotamian scribe had to learn ran into hundreds and he had to be able to handle a wet tablet and get it written before it dried. So, writing was a skilled craft but, more important, it was an enormous intellectual achievement conveying in visual form the system of sounds of a particular language. Literacy Very few Mesopotamians could read and write. Not only were there hundreds of signs to learn, many of these were complex, cp. 33. If a king could read, he made sure that this was recorded in one of his boastful inscriptions. For the most part, however, writing reflected the mode of speaking. A letter from an official would have to be read out to the king. So it would begin. To my lord A, speak, thus says your servant B, I have carried out the work assigned to me. A long mythical poem about creation ends thus. Let these verses be held in remembrance and let the elder teach them, let the wise one and the scholar discuss them. Let the father repeat them to his sons. Let the ears of even the herdsmen be opened to them. Uses of writing. Connection between city life, trade, and writing is brought out in a long Sumerian epic poem about Enmirkar, one of the earliest rulers of Arak. In Mesopotamian tradition, Arak was the city par excellence, often known simply as the city. Enmirkar is associated with the organization of the first trade of Sumer. In the early days, the epic says trade was not known. 
Amirkar wanted lapis lazuli and precious metals for the beautification of a city temple and sent his messenger out to get them from the chief of a very distant land called Aritta. Messenger heeded the word of the king. By night he went just by the stars. By day he would go by heaven's sun divine. He had to go up into the mountain ranges and had to come down out of the mountain ranges. People of Susha, a city below the mountain saluted him like tiny mice asterisk. Five mountain ranges, six mountain ranges, seven mountain ranges he crossed. Messenger could not get the chief of Aritta to part with lapis lazuli as silver and he had to make the long journey back and forth again and again, carrying threats and promises from the king of Arik. Ultimately, the messenger grew weary of mouth. He got all the messages mixed up. Then, Enmirkar formed a clay tablet in his hand and he wrote the words down. In those days, there had been no writing down of words on clay. Asterisk the poet means that once the messenger had climbed to a great height, everything appeared small in the valley far below. Given the written tablet, the ruler of Aritta examined the clay. Spoken words were nails asterisk. His face was frowning. He kept looking at the tablet. This should not be taken as the literal truth, but it can be inferred that in Mesopotamian understanding it was kingship that organized trade and writing. This poem also tells us that, besides being a means of storing information and of sending messages afar, writing was seen as a sign of the superiority of Mesopotamian urban culture. Stirrup cuneiform letters were wedge-shaped, hence, like nails. Organization in southern Mesopotamia, temples and kings. From 5000 BCE, settlements had begun to develop in southern Mesopotamia. The earliest cities emerged from some of these settlements. These were of various kinds, those that gradually developed around temples, those that developed as centers of trade and imperial cities. Cities of the first two kinds that will be discussed here. Many settlers, their origins are unknown, began to build and rebuild temples at selected spots in their villages. The earliest known temple was a small shrine made of unbaked bricks. Temples were the residences of various gods, of the moon god of her, or of an another goddess of love and war. Constructed in brick, temples became larger over time, with several rooms around open courtyards. Some of the early ones were possibly not unlike the ordinary house, for the temple was the house of a god. Temples always had their outer walls going in and out at regular intervals, which no ordinary building ever had. God was the focus of worship, to him or her people brought grain, cut and fish, the floors of some early temples had thick layers of fish bones. God was also the theoretical owner of the agricultural fields, the fisheries, and the herds of the local community. In time, the processing of produce, for example, oil pressing, grain grinding, spinning, and the weaving of woolen cloth was also done in the temple. Organizer of production at a level above the household, employer of merchants and keeper of written records of distributions and allotments of grain, flour animals, bread, beer, fish, etc., the temple gradually developed its activities and became the main urban institution. There was also another factor on the scene. The earliest known temple of the south, C.5000 BCE, plan. In spite of natural fertility, agriculture was subject to hazards. The natural outlet channels of the Euphrates would have too much water one year and flood the crops, and sometimes they would change course altogether. As the archaeological record shows, villages were periodically relocated in Mesopotamian history. There were man-made problems as well. Those who lived on the upstream stretches of a channel could divert so much water into their fields that villages downstream were left without water. They could neglect to clean out the silt from their stretch of the channel, blocking the flow of water further down. So the early Mesopotamian countryside saw repeated conflict over land and water. The temple of a later period, C.3000 BCE, with an open courtyard and an and out facade as Excavated. When there was continuous warfare in a region, those chiefs who had been successful in war could oblige their followers by distributing the loot and could take prisoners from the defeated groups to employ as their guards or servants. So they could increase their influence and clout. Such war leaders, however, would be here today and gone tomorrow until a time came when such leadership came to increase the well-being of the community with the creation of new institutions or practices. In time, victorious chiefs began to offer precious booty to the gods and thus beautify the community's temples. They would send men out to fetch fine stones and metal for the benefit of the god and community and organize the distribution of temple wealth in an efficient way by accounting for things that came in and went out. As the poem about Enmirka shows, this gave the king high status and the authority to command the community.
can imagine a mutually reinforcing cycle of development in which leaders encourage the settlement of villages close to themselves to be able to rapidly get an army together. Sides people would be safe living in close proximity to one another. Direct one of the earliest temple towns, we find depictions of armed heroes and their victims, and careful archaeological surveys have shown that around 3000 BCE, Vinara grew to the enormous extent of 250 hectares, twice as large as Mohenjo Daro would be in later centuries, dozens of small villages were deserted. There had been a major population shift. Significantly, Aruk also came to have a defensive wall at a very early date. The site was continuously occupied from about 4200 BCE to about 400 CE, and by about 2800 BCE it had expanded to 400 hectares. A basalt style asterisk showing a bearded man twice. Note his headband and hair, waistband and long skirt. In the lower scene he attacks a lion with a huge bow and arrow. In the scene above, the hero finally kills the rampant lion with a spear, C.3200 BCE. Or captives and local people were put to work for the temple or directly for the ruler. Rather than agricultural tax was compulsory. Those who were put to work were paid rations. Hundreds of ration lists have been found which give against people's names the quantities of grain, cloth or oil allotted to them. It has been estimated that one of the temples took 1,500 men working 10 hours a day, 5 years to build. Rulers commanding people to fetch stones or metal or to come and make bricks or lay the bricks for a temple or else to go to a distant country to fetch suitable materials, there were also technical advances at Arak around 3000 BCE. Bronze tools came into use for various crafts. Architects learned to construct brick columns, there being no suitable wood to bear the weight of the roof of large halls. Hundreds of people were put to work at making and baking clay cones that could be pushed into temple walls, painted in different colors, creating a colorful mosaic. Sculpture, there were superb achievements, not an easily available clay but an imported stone. Then there was a technological landmark that we can say is appropriate to an urban economy, the potter's wheel. In the long run, the wheel enables a potter's workshop to mass-produce dozens of similar pots at a time. Asterix tells are stone slabs with inscriptions or carvings. Pression of a cylinder seal, C.3200 BCE. Bearded and armed standing figure is similar. Dress and hairstyle to the hero in the style asterisk shown above. Put three prisoners of war, their arms bound, and a fourth man beseeching the war leader. Seal, an urban artifact. In India, early stone seals were stamped. In Mesopotamia until the end of the first millennium BCE, cylindrical stone seals pierced down the center, were fitted with a stick and rolled over wet clay so that a continuous picture was created. They were carved by very skilled craftsmen and sometimes carry writing, the name of the owner, his god, his official position, etc. The seal could be rolled on clay covering the string knot of a cloth package or the mouth of a pot keeping the content safe. Rolled on a letter written on a clay tablet, it became a mark of authenticity. So the seal was the mark of a city dweller's role in public life. Five early cylinder seals and their impressions. Describe what you see in each of the impressions. Is the Kimya form script shown on them? Life in the city. What we have seen is that a ruling elite had emerged, a small section of society had a major share of the wealth. Nothing makes this fact as clear as the enormous riches, jewelry, gold vessels, wooden musical instruments inlaid with white shell and lapis lazuli, ceremonial daggers of gold, etc. Buried with some kings and queens at her. But what of the ordinary people? Asterisk a nuclear family comprises a man, his wife and children. Move from the legal texts, disputes, inheritance matters, etc. But in Mesopotamian society, the nuclear family asterisk was the norm, although a married son and his family often resided with his parents. The father was the head of the family. We know a little about the procedures for marriage. A declaration was made about the willingness to marry, the bride's parents giving their consent to the marriage. Any gift was given by the groom's people to the bride's people. When the wedding took place, gifts were exchanged by both parties, who ate together and made offerings in a temple. When her mother-in-law came to fetch her, the bride was given her share of the inheritance by her father. The father's house, herds, fields, etc., were inherited by the sons. Let us look at her, one of the earliest cities to have been excavated. Her was a town whose ordinary houses were systematically excavated in the 1930s. Narrow winding streets indicate that wheeled carts could not have reached many of the houses. Sacks of grain and firewood would have arrived on donkey back. 
Narrow winding streets and the irregular shapes of house plots also indicate an absence of town planning. Ever more street dreams of the kind we find in contemporary Mohenjo-daro. Pains and clay pipes were instead found in the inner courtyards of the air houses and it is thought that house roofs sloped in woods and rainwater was channeled via the drain pipes into some sastaric in the inner courtyards. This would have been a way of preventing the unpaved streets from becoming excessively slushy after a downpour. Sturak is sunk is a covered basin in the ground into which water and sewage flow. The residential area at Earth C, 2000 BCE. And you locate, besides the winding streets, two or three blind alleys. The people seem to have swept all their household refuse into these streets to be trodden underfoot. Smeared street levels rise, and over time the thresholds of houses had also to be raised so that no mud would flow inside after the rains. Light came into the rooms not from windows but from doorways opening into the courtyards, this would also have given families their privacy. There were superstitions about houses, recorded in omen tablets at a, a raised threshold brought wealth, a front door that did not open towards another house was lucky, but if the main wooden door of a house opened outwards instead of inwards, the wife would be a torment to her husband. There was a town cemetery at her in which the graves of royalty and commoners have been found, but a few individuals were found buried under the floors of ordinary houses. A trading town in a pastoral zone. After 2000 BC, the royal capital of Mali flourished. You will have noticed, see map 2, that Mali stands not on the southern plain with its highly productive agriculture but much further upstream on the Euphrates. Map 3 with its color coding shows that agriculture and animal rearing were carried out close to each other in this region. Some communities in the Kingdom of Mari had both farmers and pastoralists, but most of its territory was used for pasturing sheep and goats. Up 3. The Location of Mari Herders need to exchange young animals, cheese, leather and meat in return for grain, metal tools, etc., and the manure of a pen flock is also of great use to a farmer. But at the same time, there may be conflict. A shepherd may take his flock to water across his own field to the ruin of the crop. Herdsmen being mobile can raid agricultural villages and seize their stored goods. For their part, settled groups may deny pastoralists access to river and canal water along a certain set of paths. In Mesopotamian history, nomadic communities of the western desert filtered into the prosperous agricultural heartland. Shepherds would bring their flocks into the Sum area in the summer. Such groups would come in as herders, harvest laborers or hired soldiers occasionally become prosperous and settle down. A few gained the power to establish their own rule. These included the Akkadians, Amorites, Assyrians, and Arameans. We will read more about rulers from pastoral societies in theme 5. The kings of Mari were Amorites whose dress differed from that of the original inhabitants and who respected not only the gods of Mesopotamia but also raised a temple at Mari for Dagon, god of the steppe. Mesopotamian society and culture were thus open to different people and cultures, and the vitality of the civilization was perhaps due to this intermixture. A warrior holding a long spear and a wicker shield. Note the dress typical of Amorites and different from that of the Sumerian warrior shown on p. 38. This picture was incised on shell C.2600 BCE. The palace at Mari of King Zimrilam, 1810-1760 BCE. The palace at Mari of King Zimrilam, 1810-1760 BCE. Great Palace of Mari was the residence of the royal family, the hub of administration, and a place of production, especially of precious metal ornaments. It was so famous in its time that a minor king came from North Syria just to see it, carrying with him a letter of introduction from a royal friend of the king of Mari, Zimrilim. Daily lists reveal that huge quantities of food were presented each day for the king's table, flour, bread, meat, fish, fruit, beer, and wine. He probably ate in the company of many others in or around courtyard 106 paved white. You will notice from the plan that the palace had only one entrance on the north. Large open courtyards such as 131 were beautifully paved. King would have received foreign dignitaries and his own people in 132, a room with wall paintings that would have awed the visitors. The palace was a sprawling structure with 260 rooms and covered an area of 2.4 hectares. Activity 3. Trace the route from the entrance to the inner court. What do you think would have been kept in the storerooms? How has the kitchen been identified? Kings of Mari, however, had to be vigilant. Herders of various tribes were allowed to move in the kingdom, but they were watched. Camps of herders are mentioned frequently in letters between kings and officials. 
In one letter, an officer writes to the king that he has been seeing frequent fire signals at night, sent by one camp to another, and he suspects that a raid or an attack is being planned. Located on the Euphrates in a prime position for trade, in wood, copper, tin, oil, wine, and various other goods that were carried in boats along the Euphrates, between the south and the mineral-rich uplands of Turkey, Syria and Lebanon, Mari is a good example of an urban center prospering on trade. Boats carrying grinding stones, wood and wine and oil jars would stop at Mari on their way to the southern cities. Officers of this town would go aboard, inspect the cargo, a single river boat could hold 300 wine jars and levy a charge of about one-tenth the value of the goods before allowing the boat to continue downstream. Arle came in special green boats. Most important tablets refer to copper from Alashia, the island of Cyprus, known for its copper, and tea was also an item of trade. As bronze was the main industrial material for tools and weapons, this trade was of great importance. Thus, although the Kingdom of Mari was not militarily strong, it was exceptionally prosperous. Excavating Mesopotamian Towns Today, Mesopotamian excavators have much higher standards of accuracy and care in recording than in the old days, so that few dig huge areas the way was excavated. Moreover, few archaeologists have the funds to employ large teams of excavators. Thus, the mode of obtaining data has changed. The small town at Abu Salabik, about 10 hectares in area in 2500 BC with a population less than 10,000. The outlines of walls were at first traced by scraping surfaces. This involves scraping of the top few millimeters of the mound with the sharp and wide end of a shovel or other tool. While the soil underneath was still slightly moist, the archaeologist could make out different colors, textures and lines of brick walls or pits or other features. A few houses that were discovered were excavated. The archaeologists also sit through tons of earth to recover plant and animal remains and in the process identified many species of plants and animals and found large quantities of charred fish bones that had been swept out onto the streets. Plant seeds and fiber remained after dung cakes had been burned as fuel and thus kitchens were identified. Living rooms were those with fewer traces. Because they found the teeth of very young pigs on the streets, archaeologists concluded that pigs must have roamed freely here as in any other Mesopotamian town. In fact, one house burial contained some pig bones, the dead person must have been given some pork for his nourishment in the afterlife. The archaeologists also made microscopic studies of room floors to decide which rooms in a house were roofed with poplar logs, palm leaves, straw etc. and which were open to the sky. Cities in Mesopotamian culture Mesopotamians valued city life in which people of many communities and cultures lived side by side. After cities were destroyed in war, they recalled them in poetry. The most poignant reminder to us of the pride Mesopotamians took in their cities comes at the end of the Gilgamesh epic, which was written on twelve tablets. Gilgamesh is said to have ruled the city of Uruk some time after Enmerkar. The great hero who subdued people far and wide, he got a shock when his heroic friend died. He then set out to find the secret of immortality, crossing the waters that surround the world. After a heroic attempt, Gilgamesh failed and returned to Uruk. There, he consoled himself by walking along the city wall, back and forth. He admired the foundations made of fire bricks that he had put into place. It was on the city wall of Uruk that the long day of heroism and endeavor fizzles out. Gilgamesh does not say that even though he will die his sons will outlive him, as a tribal hero would have done. He takes consolation in the city that his people had built. Legacy of Writing while moving narratives can be transmitted orally, science requires written texts that generations of scholars can read and build upon. Perhaps the greatest legacy of Mesopotamia to the world is its scholarly tradition of time reckoning and mathematics. Writing around 1800 BC are tablets with multiplication and division tables, square and square root tables, and tables of compound interest. The square root of 2 was given as one plus twenty four sixty eight plus fifty one six hundred and seconds plus ten six hundred and thirds. If you work this out, you will find that the answer is one point four one four two one two nine six, only slightly different from the correct answer one point four one four two one three five six. Students had to solve problems such as the following: a field of area such and such is covered one finger deep in water. Find out the volume of water. Division of the year into 12 months according to the revolution of the moon around the earth, the division of the month into 4 weeks, the day into 24 hours, and the hour into 60 minutes, all that we take for granted in our daily lives, has come to us from the Mesopotamians. 
Roman's time divisions were adopted by the successors of Alexander and from there transmitted to the Roman world, then to the world of Islam, and then to medieval Europe. See theme 7 for how this happened. Whenever solar and lunar eclipses were observed, their occurrence was noted according to year, month, and day. So too there were records about the observed positions of stars and constellations in the night sky. None of these momentous Mesopotamian achievements would have been possible without writing and the urban institution of schools, where students read and copied earlier written tablets, and where some boys were trained to become not record keepers for the administration, but intellectuals who could build on the work of their predecessors. We would be mistaken if we think that the preoccupation with the urban world of Mesopotamia is a modern phenomenon. Let us look, finally, at two early attempts to locate and preserve the texts and traditions of the past. An early library. In the Iron Age, the Assyrians of the North created an empire, at its height between 720 and 610 BCE, that stretched as far west as Egypt. State economy was now a predatory one, extracting labor and tribute in the form of food, animals, metal and craft items from a vast subject population. Great Assyrian kings, who had been immigrants, acknowledged the southern region, Babylonia, as the center of high culture and the last of them, Asurbanipal, 668-627 BCE, collected a library at his capital, Nineveh in the north. He made great efforts to gather tablets on history, epics, Omen literature, astrology, hymns and poems. He sent his scribes south to find old tablets. Because scribes in the south were trained to read and write in schools where they all had to copy tablets by the dozen, there were towns in Babylonia where huge collections of tablets were created and acquired fame. And although Sumerian ceased to be spoken after about 1800 BCE, it continued to be taught in schools through vocabulary texts, sign lists, bilingual, Sumerian and Akkadian, tablets, etc. So even in 650 BCE, cuneiform tablets written as far back as 2000 BCE were intelligible and the Serbanipal's men knew where to look for early tablets or their copies. Copies were made of important texts such as the Epic of Gilgamesh, the copier stating his name and writing the date. Some tablets ended with a reference to Asurbanipal, I Asurbanipal, king of the universe, king of Assyria, on whom the gods bestowed vast intelligence, who could acquire the recondite details of scholarly erudition. I wrote down on tablets the wisdom of the gods, and I checked and collated the tablets. I placed them for the future in the library of the temple of my god, Nabu, at Nineveh, for my life and the well-being of my soul, and to sustain the foundations of my royal throne. More important, there was cataloging, a basket of tablets would have a clue label that read, a number of tablets about exorcism, written by X. Serbanipal's library had a total of some 1,000 texts, amounting to about 30,000 tablets, grouped according to subject. And an early archaeologist. A man of the southern marshes, Nabopolassar, released Babylonia from Assyrian domination in 625 BCE. His successors increased their territory and organized building projects at Babylon. From that time, even after the Achaemenids of Iran conquered Babylon in 539 BCE and until 331 BCE when Alexander conquered Babylon, Babylon was the premier city of the world, more than 850 hectares, with a triple wall, great palaces and temples, a ziggurat or step tower, and a processional way to the ritual center. Trading houses had widespread dealings and its mathematicians and astronomers made some new discoveries. Bonidus was the last ruler of independent Babylon. He writes that the god of her came to him in a dream and ordered him to appoint a priestess to take charge of the cult in that ancient town in the deep south. He writes, Because for a very long time the office of high priestess had been forgotten, her characteristic features nowhere indicated, I bethought myself day after day. Then, he says, he found the stall of a very early king whom we today date to about 1150 BCE and saw on that stall the carved image of the priestess. He observed the clothing and the jewelry that was depicted. This is how he was able to dress his daughter for her consecration as priestess. On another occasion, Nabonidus's men brought to him a broken statue inscribed with the name of Sargon, king of Akkad. We know today that the latter ruled around 2370 BCE. Bonidus, and indeed many intellectuals, had heard of this great king of remote times. Bonidus felt he had to repair the statue. Because of my reverence for the gods and respect for kingship, he writes, I summoned skilled craftsmen and replaced the head. Activity 4. Why do you think Asurbanipal and Nabonidus cherished early Mesopotamian traditions? Thank you. Have a good day.